the thyroid gland. It's a small gland that controls your metabolism. If you're feeling fatigued, off mood, maybe loss of hair, weight gain, loss of appetite, you could have a problem with your thyroid gland. So we have with us Dr. Usha Sriram from Voluntary Health Services Chennai. Please tell us why is hypothyroidism considered as a lifelong disease? So thank you Bhagyashree for having me in your program. Very important question you're asking because once the thyroid gland stops working, um, very few percentage recover in the sense it, it, you know we'll have to give the medication throughout life. We can't make the gland work again. Main reason why the thyroid gland stops working is what's called autoimmune disease. Auto means self, immune is antibodies. Our own body makes antibodies against our own cells and gland. So autoimmune thyroid is the number one cause of thyroid um, hypothyroidism. Because once the thyroid gland stops working, um, very few percentage recover. So you mean there is no alternate therapy or medication can't even start the process of the thyroid gland working again? We cannot yet. We haven't found a way uh, to make the gland um, work again. Maybe sometime in the future. But right now all we can do is replace the what the gland does. And we can do that beautifully with the thyroid hormone. As we all know that TSH is produced by the pituitary gland and then it uh, tells the thyroid gland to produce T3 and T4 and that gets the metabolism working. Okay. So when we talk about hypothyroidism, what exactly is it that goes wrong in this? Most of the time, it's the thyroid gland that stops working. Maybe because of autoimmune, maybe because somebody had surgery on the thyroid, uh, maybe there was some uh, radioactive iodine used. What the reason? The, the thyroid gland stops working then it sends signals to the pituitary mm. saying that the, the hormone levels are low. So then the pituitary makes the TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. So it tries to stimulate the gland to make more hormone. And since the gland is not working, it cannot make more hormone. So the TSH level goes up. Okay. So that's really what That's happens. how you come to know in the reports yeah. that, you Simple know, there's something test. wrong. Yeah. Okay. And, um, why is it so that the women end up suffering more from this than the male gender? The number one reason, all autoimmune disorders are more common in women. More women have um, hypothyroidism and also women go through certain life cycles or phases in their life when the thyroid hormone is very, very important. So we're also looking for it. So mm -hmm. there's more testing, there's actually more autoimmune problems. And, and maybe more, um, you know, situations where we have to look for it, like weight gain or pregnancy or conditions like that. So you mean weight gain or pregnancy can actually trigger this? When a woman gains weight or a man, but mostly women are more issues with weight gain, uh, we, we look for what could be the cause of the weight gain. Okay. And one of the first things we do is a thyroid test, a TSH. Okay. So we may pick it up. You know, so that that's when you realize that yeah. you might have yeah. this. So what happens if you do have hypothyroidism and you're pregnant? First thing that we want our patients to keep in mind is thyroid hormone is super important both for the pregnancy, for the mother and for the baby. Okay. So the first 10 weeks of pregnancy, the baby has thyroid is still not fully developed. So the little bit goes from mother to the baby through the placenta. And after 10 weeks, the baby has its own thyroid, it's making thyroxine. But the mother needs it now for her blood pressure and uh, for glucose control. And so women who have hypothyroidism that's not well controlled, they're at greater risk for blood pressure during pregnancy, gestational diabetes, even pregnancy losses. So we, we are really very particular that their levels are perfectly maintained and there are guidelines for that. We want the TSH to be below 2.5 in the first trimester, below three in the second and third. So we follow that very diligently. And can a woman get pregnant in case she does have hypothyroidism? If she's um, you know, adequately, optimally well treated. Mm -hmm. So we suggest that all women who are planning a pregnancy 
get their thyroid test done before, a few months before they're planning the pregnancy. So even if it is abnormal, they can um, you know, fix it and then get pregnant. So okay. that preconception care is very, very important because the first 10 weeks, like I said, the baby doesn't have a thyroid. Okay. So, and usually we find out only in the first few weeks and by the time they go see a doctor, those 10, we are almost there and that window is closing. Doctor, another very important, every time a person has been diagnosed with thyroid, most of their doctors or caretakers tell them not to have uh, vegetables like cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage. Somehow I wouldn't prescribe to that idea because I feel these vegetables contain so many nutrients and so many vitamins that we normally require for our body. I definitely want to know what are your views on this. We now tell them they can eat anything they want. No restriction on any fruit or vegetables or anything. The reason why they, you know, a uh, lot of people in the past and maybe now some uh, said don't eat cauliflower, cabbage, uh, broccoli, radish and all those kind of things is because they were considered uh, goitrogens, meaning they had substances that made you get a goiter. Goiter just means an enlarged thyroid. Mm -hmm. So long, long ago when we had iodine deficiency, which is very big, especially in our country, a lot of people had already some tendency to form goiters and so these goitrogens either made it bigger and again there is a legend that this all started when they were feeding rabbits uh, you know lettuce and things like that cabbage and they developed goiters many years ago so now we do not ask any of our patients to not eat any of this just one food thing that I want to mention is um, if somebody has hypothyroidism and taking thyroxin we tell them not to overdo the millets so doc then um, what about soy again soy in moderation is okay um, we don't recommend soy based infant formula for mm -hmm. babies with hypothyroidism otherwise unless they have a health issue and um, they have to take soy milk um, I usually tell my uh, women patients um, not to um, overdo the soy because again so is a phytoestrogen, mm -hmm. not the, the goitrogen part, but a phytoestrogen. And we do not know long-term effects of those things on breast and other estrogen-sensitive tissues. So everything in moderation. You mean uh, less of soya bean, less of tofu also? I mean, all in moderation. We don't want to overdo it. Every okay. now and then you include it in your diet, it's mm -hmm. good. But then what happens with food is somebody hears it's good for you mm -hmm. and then they make you know, eat their main meal. We okay. don't want to do those because our genes mm -hmm. have adapted to our food over generations. And they, you know, that science is very, very important. And, and so there may be countries where people eat a lot of soy, but we are not used to eating that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in moderation. Do you also believe that having hypothyroidism can lead to diabetes or hypertension or any other such diseases? I don't think it leads to those conditions, but they can coexist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, recently we uh, have um, seen a lot of um, diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is an autoimmune condition by itself. Since thyroid is an autoimmune condition, they are all like a family members. One doesn't lead to the other, but they're all part of the same family. So it can be present more in, in, in patients with, with hypothyroidism. With type 2 diabetes, which is a more common one, there's um, more and more evidence saying that people with type 2 diabetes may be at greater risk for hypothyroidism also, both overt and, and subclinical. Um, but then they may also be just coexisting because of age and other conditions. If someone has hypothyroidism and they're not taking their medication, their levels are not good, they can have, their blood pressure can be higher. Okay. because they have more water retention mm -hmm. in the body. Mm -hmm. It can be higher. Therefore, it's important to keep your levels um, you know, perfectly in the good range. One thing that I have heard so often is if you're taking medication for uh, high blood pressure, you, over a period of time, do end up getting diabetes. High mm -hmm. blood pressure and diabetes, um, are they coexist a lot. I think I would like to say as much as one-third to one-half of 
uh, you know, patients with the diabetes will also have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So taking the blood pressure medicine does not cause diabetes. Having said that, there is a one medicine which is a diuretic, a, a, a water pill. Mm -hmm. They used to give that as the first line of treatment for people with high blood pressure. And that can cause your blood sugar to go up a little bit. Okay. Uh, but now we nowadays we don't use that as a first line at all. So is there any medicine that is given for hypothyroidism that has similar effects? No, hypothyroidism just treated with a simple thyroxine. Okay. And, um, and that's all uh, patients need. They don't need anything else. And how should this medication be taken? So this is the most important thing, I, I think, on counseling patients on how it needs to be taken. So it's um, once a day, one tablet. So when I started practicing, it only came in one strength, 100 microgram. So people used to talk about just, I, I take one tablet. But now it comes in nine strengths, 10 strengths. So um, all the way from, you know, 0.125 all the way up. We have this, um, you know, room to work with different doses. So they have to take the correct dosage in the morning. As soon as they wake up, brush their teeth, take this tablet with only water, not coffee, tea or any other drink. Take it. Wait for a good half an hour. Some people say even up to 45 minutes. So wait for that and then have their morning breakfast or coffee, all of those things. Should not be taken with um, calcium, iron, um, you know, antacids, sucralfate. We have a bunch of medicines. Actually, we tell them don't take it with anything else. Just, just the thyroxine. Just the thyroxine. Because it's so important. If we take anything else, um, what should be absorbed, let's say 100%, will only get absorbed 30%, 40, 50 in that range. So we'll miss out on a lot of the medicines. So unless we give all these instructions, right? Okay, very easy for for patient. They have a busy morning, and and some people, in especially in Chennai, they wake up and the first thing they have to do is have their coffee. Even that half an hour seems like a huge punishment for them, but um, this counseling has to go on. The way to overcome that is, you can either set an alarm or, very rarely, for those who are um, who absolutely cannot wake up in the morning or have other issues, they can even take it at night. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the only thing to keep in mind is that because in India, we eat our dinner very late mm -hmm. and within a little bit go to bed. So there's not that time for the, you know, for the food. Otherwise, food is in the stomach. So what we tell our patients is eat your dinner. You have to give a good two hours. Mm -hmm. And then you can take the tablet. So essentially the tablet has to be had on an empty stomach. There is no problem having it at night if it's the last thing that you do while going to provided. sleep. Provided you have had an early dinner, say around 7 o'clock. Right? For very few people, special circumstances, who cannot take it first thing in the morning, rarely they can do this. I think one thing that every person who is on this hypothyroidism medicine needs to know is that since there are different strengths of medicine before two visits to the doctor they cannot change the strength by themselves absolutely. is that right absolutely and what happens if they do that this dosing has to be very precise and that's why we monitor the tsh and, and tweak the dose and if they are taking it very regularly following all the instructions they're going to stay stable you know patients come and tell me my levels fluctuate a lot they really don't fluctuate um, if their weight fluctuates a lot the dosage can change otherwise it's usually because they send somebody to the pharmacy to pick up the medicine the pharmacist would have said I'm run out of 50 micrograms instead I've given 25 ask your you know this patient to take two at a time okay and that may not have gotten translated and patients will end up taking just one of the 25 or even a higher dosage and will not know anything about it till either they start feeling symptoms or they go for a next test. So if they're taking too much, their heart can start racing, heartbeat can increase. Um, and if they already have an underlying heart issue or something, it can set them up for uh, you know, problems like um, even a, 
uh, heart attack or oh, heart really? failure or uh-huh. yeah um, depending on how fast the heart is going so that's very important and in women we've been talking about mm-hmm. women uh, after menopause we know that they uh, lose bone right osteoporosis right. can happen so if women are taking too much not too long but if they take a very high dose higher than they need their bone loss can increase so this actually is a hormone replacement yeah. tablet right and that can lead to bone loss i'm saying if they take too much if they're supposed to take 100 by mistake they're taking 150 okay or if they have not checked their levels in a few years mm-hmm. and suddenly they find that their levels are high those things are not safe so we must keep the levels precisely where it should be which is why taking it regularly monitoring it regularly at least once a year and and taking the the correct dosage and not changing things on their own there are um, you know many um, uh, you know brands many dosages available i recommend to my patient you buy whatever brand you are using stick to that okay and if any dosage change has to happen it has to be done by your doctor So in that case doctor how often should a patient come to any doctor to check that ehs levels someone yeah. who has been having uh, yeah once a year is enough uh, in in adults in children of course we check more frequently because mm-hmm. they are growing and their weight is changing their bo- you know requirements are different but in adults once a year is enough provided that their weight is stable and so and they've not been put on other medicines and all that so um for example i just have now um, an 88 year old doctor mm-hmm. who got put on amiodarone which is a heart medicine okay. and suddenly her thyroid um, acted you know, up uh, uh, you know requirement has changed right. so it's very important for all patients to keep their doctor up, you know uh, abreast of what other of other complications and yeah. other complications and so once a year and what happens post menopause i mean if a woman gets hypothyroidism during or post menopause does she have to come and check her levels more often since i mean menopause itself causes so much of imbalance uh, sure i think when they have symptoms mm-hmm. and and symptoms of hypothyroidism are what we call non specific so it could be uh, tiredness and or not feeling you know mood sharp, swings fatigue mood swings fatigue lethargy constipation right. weight gain Um, when hair fall mm-hmm. when all this happens people think it could be just their menopause or it so th- it's best to come to the you know doctor to find out maybe it's a totally correctable thing like hypothyroidism it's very important thank you so much doctor i think our discussion today should shed light on many issues where hypothyroidism is concerned and for all you people if you want to know anything more on hypothyroidism do contact dr usha shri ram on the number given below